Wish there was more. Stan, of course, died in an aircraft fire 10 years ago when he was 33. In fact, there is more of his music, music that's been preserved in the private archives of his family and friends. Stan Rogers recorded a body of work that never made it on his albums. Songs taped at rehearsals, at concerts, some songs composed for the CBC. Ariel Rogers, Stan's wife, is here with some of that music. Hi. Hi. How, much, how many of these songs are out there unreleased? I would say probably 30. Really? Not necessarily 30 that you could actually release. Because um, they're not good enough? Because they're not good enough. They're just not clear enough on the tapes. There's an awful lot, lot of other stuff happening in the background. Are these um, sort of rough sketches, some of them? Or? Some of them are rough, uh, particularly a couple of pieces that uh, might have made it onto From Fresh Water and, and didn't. Sometimes they didn't fit the mix. I mean, Stan would start writing something, and by the time he was through with several songs, something didn't fit, so so it was out. Or he didn't like exactly the way it felt, mm -hmm. so it didn't make it. It sort of got back burnered. Not to say that it would never get on a future release, but it was just it was wasn't up to scratch somehow for him, yeah. and you, you couldn't really tell why. Wait a Maybe we should play one first, and we'll get because we we will be playing this today and and through the week. And we start with a song called "Straight and True." What do we need to know about this? Straight and true. Stan wrote after he had had several discussions with a recording company in the states. Not going to mention the name. Um, Ariel, am I getting some sense of where this song is going? What this uh, song is going to well, be about? Perhaps yes. Uh, there was always... Is there a touch of the feisty stand in here? Yeah, absolutely. Let me play it and we'll talk some more. At Lincoln Center, a freak of weather a taste of sea and I was back in Nova Scotia and all my friends were there with me they were drinking diamonds singing Carter and passing them from mouth to mouth it sounded like goodbye and I knew that I was headed south the bitter south in my Uncle's Kitchen, the songs are bitchin' or some Hank Williams blue. And I hear my cousins' voices singing the very best that they can do. And it doesn't matter what we're drinking, the ocean brings the flavor through. And if none of this is fancy, the love is always straight and true, straight and true. There's something about it I can't live without the coast The rhythmic ocean The clean, wholesome motion Of most of my friends They're swaying by the trees Singing of the sea Now, city streets They can't hold me when I'm most alone Going on I think I'm ready, my hands are steady I've had enough of beer and dough And even if New York rejects me I'll always have the hope that I soon will be there. Do I love it? Yes, I guess you could say I do. Pick it with my people where the music's always straight and true. Straight and true. You know there's something about it. I can't live without the coast. The rhythmic ocean, the clean, wholesome motion of most of my friends there swaying by the trees singing of the sea now 
city streets They can't hold me when I'm most alone I'm going on Stan Rogers recorded at Fiddler's Green Coffee House in Toronto around 1976. And I'm with Ariel Rogers, <coughs> Ariel Rogers, excuse me, Stan's wife, <coughs> excuse me again, and the executor of his musical estate. I am choked up a bit, but that's also got a cold. But that, that I, that's not the song I expected. See, a little explanation there. In, in New York City, he, he was at Lincoln Center, and he went round the corner, and out of nowhere came the smell of clam flats and that's one of the things that triggered this this particular song this this all of a sudden he smelled the sea mm -hmm. and the juxtaposition of being down there and dealing with the wheeler dealers mm -hmm. and this whole sort of memory of Nova Scotia and the smell of the clam flats and and all of the stuff that went on in, in terms of his musical development came together and and he said it was just a most amazing feeling because there are no clam flats in New York City at least not that we know of. Not that we know about. No, so he goes back to drinking diamond, singing Carter, and the cousins there. Now, who would they be? The cousins in there are there. What's that family name? It was his grandfather's name. Bushel. Bushel. It. That's his mum's family. Yeah. The Bushel family. So that's who he's talking about playing. Picking that's in? that's probably who he's talking about mostly. But you know, it's a because there's so many of them. I mean, she came from a family of twelve, and then they sort of. Uh, took an extra cousin in yeah. as well. Now this is Mum's family, yeah. okay, and and all of those cousins, and then the, the 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 children of all of those people. Stan had seventy seven first cousins. You're kidding? No, and and seventy seven first cousins. First cousins. I mean, that's half in Nova Scotia now, yeah, right? We got up to second cousins. You couldn't count them. <laughs> so, and a lot of them were really musical, uh, or or just enjoyed being there singing along with uh yeah. with with their other cousins a lot stan, of them played guitar stan was as nova scotia as you could get mm -hmm. he looked like a nova scotian he sang like a nova scotian he, he wrote about nova scotia he couldn't get by without the coast and he didn't come from nova scotia that's right <laughs> he was born in hamilton ontario that's right, right. But went there. He went very early, didn't he? When they were very five or something. Very early, yes, down. really early. Uh, they started going back down east uh, to visit family. His mother's family was from Cancel Town area, yeah. and his father's family was from Pictou County. Obviously, uh, really, an intense experience. Every time they went down, he was so drawn to the to the east coast. Could he sail? Did he sail? Because he wrote all kinds of sea songs. Was he a sailor? You know, I hate to say this about him, Peter, because it really will disillusion people, but Stan did not do well on a boat. He liked being out in a motorboat for short periods <laughs> at high speeds. <laughs> and he didn't mind getting in the water once in a while. Um, but he was not a sailor. <laughs> I sort of like this, actually. I don't. I don't. He did I'm spend some time throwing up overside. <laughs> Big Stan Rogers with a no. Our hero, yes, what? stood a trick uh, at the wheel of the Blue Nose mm -hmm. uh, for about ten or fifteen minutes years and years ago, and the, our children all sort of sat there in wonder and watched him do this. But he was quite green by the time we got back to the dock. <laughs> There goes another myth, a great Canadian. Another myth. great Canadian myth. <laughs> we have a song from earlier in his early in his career. This is on land, I take it. This is Guysborough Train. That's right. Anything we should know about this, or we just will let her roll. This this song's about his roots, and it's uh, Paul Mills will say that it, this is probably uh, his first truly marketable song, um, but shows very clearly his amazing ability to marry the music and the poetry. Just little lines like. Uh, I've sat in your kitchen and talked about walls. I mean, that's a whole world inside of each individual's head right yeah. there in one line. 
amazing ability to do that. Uh, this is when I think 72 or something, right? Yes. You stand. a young Stan Rogers. Yeah? That's a very young Stan Rogers. Yeah. I mean, you can even you can hear some of the things in his voice that were to become so characteristic of him, starting to form there. You yes. know, the deep line and there the the big bass. And I don't know what the musical term is, but when he goes <laughs> up and it's and he's, <laughs> well, but it's so many Stan. And some of the writing is still rough around the edges. The yes. interval is clear and stuff. Yeah. But it's a good song. It is a good song, and uh, it and. Stan, who always said he never wrote a political song until the House of Orange, uh, 
had actually in that song made a political statement because what he was talking about was uh, the promises were the promises of several governments liberal and and uh and tory mm -hmm. to put a railway through to the north shore and uh still hasn't happened you can still travel the back roads there and see these huge concrete abutments that that went into place more and more each time uh the political party changed yeah. but the tracks never got on them Ariel, I wouldn't hold my breath till we come out <laughs> either. <laughs> we could keep playing that song for a little for a little while. How did he write? How did Stan write? Sometimes this look would come across his face, and he would sit down and and just just write. He would hear something in his head, and he'd sit down and and he'd write all the words. There they'd be on the paper, and and he'd, he'd play with them a bit. But the tune was already in there, mm -hmm. and then he'd just noodle with it till he got it till he got it right. Other times, it was a more concerted effort. For instance, if he was doing something for CBC that was definitely of a commissioned nature, mm -hmm. he would do some research around it. He'd, he'd play with it uh, on different levels. He'd, he'd uh, you know, ferret out people that he could talk to about this particular circumstance. Um, he'd talk to the person who wrote the play that he was supposed to be writing the music to. And then he'd go from there. But he always had uh, almost an inspired place that, that it came from. Hmm. When did he really come into his own as a songwriter? Is it, is, you said Paul Mills, who was a friend and a CBC radio producer and who sometimes recorded with him. Yeah. He, he would have said around Guysborough Train, but when did you think he was... I really with? think that the watershed song for Stan in terms of making a statement for himself as a singer-songwriter is Song of the Candle. Mm -hmm. Because it addressed the frustration in making that choice. Now, he had not at that point in time actually said, yeah, I'm going to be a songwriter. Yeah, I mean, he was in university and, and trying very hard to get his head around what he termed a really stifling uh, environment. He went to McMaster and Trent. for And a Trent. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he used, to, he used to say he went to McMaster and then he went to Trent for a week. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now we have a song where he's still finding himself. This is the piece of a song called Past 50. But well, this is recorded, when, this is 73 or so? Yes. This is on the, actually on the same uh, 45 as Skysburg Train. It's a CBC transcription, I think, is it? That's right. So here's Stan, Stan Rogers, 19, so, oh, I don't know, 72, 73, somewhere.
about Stan Rogers, and I'm talking with Ariel Rogers about some of Stan's unpublished music. <laughs> Someone said that you said Stan looked at the world with old eyes. What did you mean? He seemed to have uh, a grasp of what was happening. He always said he didn't have intuition. He'd poo-poo anyone who said he had intuition. But he had an insight into the human situation, the, in, just what people go through that was beyond his small experience. Mm -hmm. Writing things like Delivery Delayed, for instance. Stan had never been in a, in a, a labor room when he wrote that song. He, he knew very, very little about uh, the process of... of birth and, and delivery, that sort of thing. And yet he wrote that, that amazing piece of music. Where'd that come from? Had he ever been in a, be, behind a plow when he wrote Field Behind the Plow? No. Ariel? No, he was driving across <laughs> Saskatchewan at 4.30 in the morning, flat out going somewhere, either going to a gig or coming home. And there was a farmer out in his field, first light of dawn, plowing. And it, it just struck him. He thought, my God. It had never, like he knew that people got up really early, but at 4.30 in the morning, crack of dawn, here's this guy out there. It was supposed to rain that day, and he's out there, and he's plowing, mm. putting another season's promise. He just saw the vision, he just yeah. saw that and kept on driving and started writing in his head or something? Yeah, literally. And there's a wonderful story to sort of put back to back with that. And that's the story about a farmer who was out plowing in his field and heard the music on the radio in his tractor, Stan always liked to say it was his air-conditioned tractor, mm -hmm. and didn't have a pencil and a paper, got out of his tractor and wrote the CBC information in the dust on the wheel guard of his tractor. And when he got home that night, wrote it down on a piece of paper and wrote to the CBC to find out where he could get more of that good music. You mean he wrote M5W1E6 or, or whatever I no the equivalent idea. was? He I wrote know. the address of where he could get the music uh, now, come on, on the wheel guard of his come tractor. On. There's a wind <laughs> going to blow that off, the dust of the wheel guard. That's I like guess that dust was thick. I think he this swore, is one of those stories no, about marking the spot true. on the sea where you caught your last codfish. <laughs> you didn't write this. That... He did. Mom still has the letter. Oh, from the farmer? Yep. Oh, okay, then I believe it. <laughs> There's a hunger for more of his music. This is a lot of people. I mean, there's a, there's a, it's good to be doing this, to, to show these other ones. But it's taken a long time. It's, it, it took you a while. Took me a while. That's right. Took me a long time. I could listen to his music. Um, I could talk to people about his music. What happened for, for us, for myself, and, and for my children after his death was... Um, nothing short of astounding we spent so much time i spent so much time uh worrying about them and talking to other people uh and and trying to help them deal with this incredible loss that i i put my own feelings about this away in the background and mm. didn't really start to deal with them until a couple of years ago and simply was not able to go into a studio and sit down there and listen to it and i wasn't comfortable with someone else doing that either mm. so uh yeah everything in its time are your plans to make more albums or make release or do things with this music so yeah far? another at least one more cd uh cassette release of heretofore unpublished music and uh another one i like to do of stan doing other people's music oh yeah some really interesting stuff. He, uh, you know that Fred Neal tune, Never Get Out of These Blues Alive? Yeah. Well, we have a recording. I would of sing it for you if Stan it weren't illegal for me to sing. Doing that. He could do that because he had that same drop <laughs> and drop ability of wonderful his. Wonderful like, recording of him doing this at Smales Pace in London. Wonderful. Yeah, unbelievable. And then there's some really neat CBC stuff that Stan wrote uh, music for stories, uh, well, Silver Donald's The Two Sisters, yeah. uh, uh, Orders for New Day, things like that. People have never heard the music for those. And I think it would be fun to sort of see if we could get some or all of it onto to CD. We're going to play some more later in this week, but, but uh, as, as you come back, 
you being Ariel Rogers, but this, the song we're going to conclude with today is Pharisee. What's that? That's an odd song. He, he wrote that, um, actually wrote it in London in 1974. I don't particularly love this song. Uh, I understand what he was trying to say, and the reason it didn't make it onto an album was because Stan didn't particularly like it after he finished it, but it said something for that point in his life. Here it is. I've been speaking with Ariel Rogers, and this is Stan. I used to be a Pharisee Cynical and wise, telling rich and godly lies of humanity but in the marketplace was seated a cripple with a liar. I looked at him and said, I've been rich but so unhappy. What said you so on fire? And he said, look upon me, brother. I am a man with peace of mind. You know I've never been much good at nothing but the words I wrote in rhyme. circa 1976. We'll have more of Stan's unpublished music tomorrow. After the news, though, our regular report from Quebec. Released on record today. Ooh, love songs. Love good, songs. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> so he only wrote one. Did he say he only wrote one love song? 45 so he only wrote years. One love song. Yeah, 45 years. And uh, no, I don't think that's true. I, there were there were other songs that if they if they weren't um, of the same import or or have the same impact as 45 years, they're nevertheless love songs to some extent. Why would he say that, that he'd only written one? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's what he thought. <laughs> did, he, did he think of himself as a romantic? I think he probably viewed himself as being able to capture the classically romantic sense uh, 
uh, of things and uh, style. Mm -hmm. um, he understood about romance as we understand it classically in, in literature. Like to him, the Hornblower series that that was high romance in in many ways. <laughs> Isn't it? I mean, that sounds really odd, but um, I think he was a romantic, but he probably would have said no. <laughs> Here's a song called Louise's Song. Let's play this first and then talk about it. I would have been here sooner your note came yesterday, but yesterday was crazy. There was much to square away. Then I tried to come this morning, but the old car wouldn't run, and the buses run so slowly. There was nothing to be done but you. You don't need my troubles. I'm here now anyway. There's nothing left behind me To say I cannot stay When I told you that I love you I said call me anytime And especially when you need someone When things get out of line And oh There's a burden in your eyes And the hand you put in mine Won't stop trembling Oh, tell me what you're going through Cause all I want to do is be protecting No, all those shadows on your face They look so out of place They should be sunlight I want to take you when the smile returns And keep you from the night I don't know how we happen when we're kept so far apart. There sure are lots worse prisons than the kind with iron bars, and it almost makes me crazy to see you hurt inside when you're beautiful and really need to let things open wide and oh there's a burden in your eyes and the hand you put in mine won't stop trembling oh tell me what you're going through cause all I want to do protecting no all those shadows on your face they look so out of place they should be sunlight i want to take you when the smile returns and keep you from the night and wake up to see me in your eyes i want to take you the smile returns and keep you from the night and wake up to see me in your eyes that's Stan Rogers and Louise's song there was a Louise there was a Louise yeah and there were iron bars there were iron bars this a uh lady that Stan met when they did a gig at the Kingston prison for women and he connected with this woman obviously on a very real level she was in there for uh, oh that had something to do with marijuana yeah. <laughs> bring it across the border or something like that really really interesting woman uh, I met her actually and uh, I guess she, she lives happily somewhere in the States, hmm? married, has kids. I wouldn't think that when you did those, those inside the prison gigs that you get a chance to talk to the prisoners very much. I don't think so, no, but, but they did manage to have some sort of conversation. Um, and 
it, he didn't play there just once. He was there a couple of times, and they corresponded over a period of several months. Huh. And he he was intensely frustrated. It was very it, he he himself said this was this was a very romantic situation. I mean, he really liked this woman, couldn't get at her, she couldn't get out, um, and it was it had all the elements of of true pathos. <laughs> Or flirtation. I mean, one of the oh, it's the wonderful. Best people to flirt with are those who are totally you unavailable. You can't get to you. at. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I don't think was Stan a ladies man. I don't think of him as a ladies man. No, no, he wasn't. I, I, th I he think was cute. It, he was cute, but well, God, you wouldn't want to tell him that. Um, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I wouldn't. No. <laughs> you don't call a man this big cute. Um, no, I think uh, I think he knew that he was attractive, but he w he suspected uh, that perhaps sometimes there was an element of uh, a groupy thing happening there, and and he oh, yeah. was just totally revolted by anything that that smacked of that. He it, it really frightened him, actually, in some ways, because he didn't know what to do with it. He'd always, I mean, he was called Pumpkinhead when he was a kid. He was told, you know, by his, you know, his schoolmate, you're 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 an ugly kid with a fat head, and. And uh, like it wouldn't matter how often your your parents reassured you about the fact yeah. that you're okay, and you'd still grow up with this idea of yourself. So no, he never thought he was attractive. Uh, so did he write a, a song of seduction with a purpose? Gee, he did write one once um, called "Lady Dress Up," yeah. and he said it was aimed specifically at trying to sort of convince a, a certain particular lady that uh, he really did want to spend some time with her and apparently it worked <laughs> this is all we know or all we're telling <laughs> oh this is all we're telling this actually we'd like to uh we'd like to put this uh particular piece on uh on the cd of unreleased stuff because it is it's quite lovely yeah buttons and braces and ribbons and laces are not what you are you know it's it's it, it generally a statement trying to convince her to take off her clothes <laughs> he was young he was young he was down, yes <laughs> and it's and as far as we know it worked uh, he said so he said so <laughs> guess they went swimming then eh yeah guess they did eh <laughs> let's finish here for this morning with it all fades away what's this, what's this? it all fades away well uh at one point, uh, early in stands of my relationship, we had um, a hiatus in that relationship. We were apart for several months. And this is a song that he wrote shortly after we separated, before we got back together, obviously. <laughs> Ariel Rogers, and she will be back tomorrow. Here is Stan Rogers. <laughs> Conversation in a picture of the past, like the one that I just found you among many that I had. I remember saw you laughing with my camera close at hand. We were minutes from a quarrel and forever from understanding. Now you were just a bit excited and a little more displeased. How you hated candy pictures when I took them just to tease. Then you told I was crazy, I said I was born that way And we must have said those same two lines Twenty times a day Now I'd swear you don't remember why we parted Just like I cannot remember why we loved Ain't it funny how the past makes for better memories last Cause it ain't fades away It all fades away
More unpublished Stan Rogers tomorrow, more Morningside right after the news. I'm Peter Zosky. Good countrymen, my name is Billy Green, and I will tell the things I did when I was just 19. I helped defeat the Yank invader, there can be no doubt, yet lately men forget the name of Billy Green the Scout. Was on a Sunday morning, June, when first we heard the sound. Three thousand Yankees on the road to Camp Hello, Green Town. Two generals, artillery, and company of horse. With many rank and file of foot, they were a mighty force. Says I to Brother Levi, well, we still can have some fun. We'll creep and whoop like Indians to try to make them run. Which then we did both loud and long, much to the Yanks' dismay. They fired their popgun muskets once and then they ran away. Well, first they plundered Stony Creek and then John Gage's farm. They cut his fences for their fires, although the day was warm. They bound my brother Isaac up and took him from his home. They pillaged all the countryside, no mercy there was shown. Then says I to myself, now Billy, this will never do. Those scurvy Yanks are not the match for loyalists like you. My brother's horse I quickly got and put him to a run and reached the British camp upon the heights of Burlington. Says I to Colonel Harvey, now let there be no delay. If we're to reach the Yankee camp before the break of day, I'll take you through the woods by night where I know every tree. And ere the dawn you surely can surprise the enemy. With men and guns we then set forth the enemy to see. Across the beach at Burlington and then to Red Hill Creek. We came upon their sentries, we surprised them every one. One died upon my sword and all the others off they run. And so it was we were in place one hour before dawn. We fired three times upon the camp and then we marched along. We fired again and charged as Colonel Harvey gave the word and put the enemy to flight with bayonet and sword. With great confusion in the camp, two generals were caught. The colonel and his men made their artillery as not. We killed over two hundred and we captured all the rest. Nor did we lose but eighty men of them, we had the best. And so it was I played the man, though I was but nineteen. I led our forces through the night that this land would be free. I foiled the Yank invaders and I helped put them to rout. So let no man forget the name of Billy Green the Scout. That's Stan Rogers, and all this week Ariel Rogers has been Ariel Rogers has been coming in to talk about and play some of Stan's songs, songs that have rarely been heard, songs he never put on record. Ariel's with me again today. Hi, that's a true story. I bet. That's a true story. Billy Green. The Embellished story. slightly. Oh yeah. But it's a true story. One of Canada's lesser-known little heroes. War of eighteen twelve. Farm boy. Yeah. How would he find that? Where, when, what? Where? Oh, he read. Stan read everything. He had five or six books going all the time. Mm -hmm. And he just, he read voraciously. Anything he could find. Now, it's really hard to find stuff on Billy Green, the scout. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, yeah, but it's out there. He liked, uh, they're the heroes. I mean, there are lots of heroes. Good old swashbuckling heroes in his historical time. He fun. loved heroes. He loved real heroes, but he also loved the heroes in his imagination. How do you he mean? He was good at making heroes. Well, he created heroes. I mean, the, look, the five guys that, that uh, raised uh, the Mary Ellen Carter, those, those guys were heroes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But so did he want to do Mary Ellen Carter as a science fiction story? Yeah, yeah, he had a... Was had he a actually, science fiction? Oh, uh, oh yes, oh yes, very definitely. Clark and Purnell and, and uh, Heinlein, this, this man read a lot of sci-fi, and he envisioned uh, a radio play uh, about the Mary Ellen Carter, but the Mary Ellen Carter was not a schooner, it was a spaceship. Come on. Really? Check it out. <laughs> Rise again 25 million miles? 
<laughs> so how are you doing? <laughs> Yep. <laughs> Did he ever get to do that? Did he ever try to write the radio play? Oh, yeah. I, I have it at home. Bits and pieces of it. The song, the Billy Green the Scout, was recorded for Touch the Earth, CBC Radio, mm -hmm. 1977. How did he get on with the CBC, generally? You can be frank. Generally speaking, I think he really enjoyed working with the CBC because there were so many different ways in which he could could do that. It wasn't just one specific thing. I mean, he didn't, didn't have to come in and sort of sit down and and, uh, and just record something. He got involved in the project, and they were all different kinds of projects. He never thought the CBC paid him enough. Mm. You know, but then, you know, he said everybody was in the same boat. <laughs> Is this politically correct to say this? <laughs> well, I don't think we'll get him a raise now, but, but I think it's all right to say the CBC. <laughs> but, well, but we, <laughs> we could start on my this salary for a while, but this would help. Blast from the past. Stan says you need a raise. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'd see him around occasionally. He was always into uh, half the time when he was around. He was pitching. He was doing something that didn't directly involve himself. It seemed to me it would be like the, the Toronto Folk Festival. He tried to get going one year. Yeah, or and stuff and, like that. and he yeah he'd, he'd come in and and play on somebody else's uh, yeah album. Oh sure, or or uh, you know it, he. He loved to have a whole bunch of irons in the fire, just like he loved to be reading five or six books at a time. The song we're going to go out on this morning is one called The Siren. This is recorded for the CBC. What's this? This is part of a poetry and music special, right? That's right. Done with Bill Howell? Done with Bill Howell. Okay. With whom Stan had uh, a long and, and very happy uh, relationship. Just uh, worked really well together, these two guys. This is Ariel Rogers with whom I've been talking, and here is Stan Rogers with The Siren. Just when you think that you're all alone, and you're going home and you don't care, your hair rises up and you turn around, is standing there She who sang to the winds of old And drew the sailors to their death Stands alone in the light In a secret smile And a satin dress Control, and you wonder if you know her name She looks so familiar that you take a step And take a look again Her lips look parted with expected speech But suddenly you think a song And your body leaps to make you throw yourself away You wanna sing along Then her eyes flash fire and she widens her smile And her satin hips begin to sway and her platform shoes beat a steady tattoo which pounds into your brain. She takes a silver skull lighter to a very strange smoke and laughs your head away. Then sings like sea broken head and a harbor taste in your mouth you touch a cold cold finger to your salt stained body and you cry aloud she who sang to the winds of old and drew the sailors to their death now prowls in the night in the secret lights and a satin dress flash fire and she widens her smile and her satin hips begin to sway 
designer platform shoes beat a steady tattoo which pounds into your brain. She takes a silver skull lighter to a very strange smoke and laughs your heart away. Then sings like Stan Rogers, and I guess you have figured out that that series is on tape, eh, since I had to conclude our discussion of the hormonal treatment for the menopause in order to get it all in. The track of my beginnings has been buried neath the years. For a dozen generations, we have toiled the good land here. But now my patrimony, my inheritance is sold. To an old Rhode Island Yankee for a pocket full of gold. He comes tomorrow, I'll be giving up the land. The hills above the harbor, the rocky fields, the sand. I'll leave my crying ocean, put a shoulder to the cold. And walk out to the jingle. Of a pocket full of gold An inflationary Judas As I stare down at my hand For a pocket full of seeds Are you sure this is Stan Rogers, <laughs> right? Oh, this is really early Stan Rogers. Oh, was he 12? I don't know. No, uh, um, probably, uh, 19 or 20, but it, this Stan making probably one of his first political statements. Well, but it is so, it, to me, it is so awful because the vocal production is still, in, you know, sort of his, his old habits of singing through his nose and, and, uh, he, he his voice hadn't grown up and I think they he was it right still. Up. They it right up. Hey, we, we should play just have, let me give one, <laughs> one more taste. <laughs> From ocean on to ocean, we were true northern men. But the invader smiles beguiling, and we sell all that we hold. <laughs> well, no, you're, I guess we're allowed to laugh. Political statements, uh, be, he was being very heavy there. I mean, he was really making this, this, uh, a heavy um, statement. I mean, he really meant what he was was saying. It's just that he took so damn long to say it in this song. By the time you get to the end of it, <laughs> he's what, enough. <laughs> there's a certain anti-Americanism. I there. almost forgive the Rhode Island Yankee. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very definitely, very anti-American, and he he was uh, actually at one point in time. Uh, Sort of giving some consideration to to blowing up, uh, you know. <laughs> that record <laughs> might have been a particularly good idea. Oh no! Now, did he sing through his nose when he was young? Is that because that's I, I think he, he had did, a beautiful voice. I think he did to some extent. I'll, I'll tell you a little story about that because if if you uh, if you listen to his music up to 1973, Stan tended to do that um, quite a bit, and whether that was just uh, him learning stuff or whether it was um, something to do with uh, his nose. I have no idea. Uh, 
when I met him, and when I say met him, when I when I first hired him for for that gig in '73, that was the first time, of course, that I had spent any significant amount of time with him. Yeah. And, and I told him that he sang funny, and he was quite insulted uh, because my vocal training is of an operatic style. And I gave him a few pointers on vocal production, and. I'm not blowing my own horn or anything yeah. like that, but if you listen to his his voice before and after we like met, Stan. this man sounds significantly different within six months. You could make me sound like Stan Rogers, could you? Uh, no. Oh. <laughs> no, because if I... If but I, if you can talk, you can sing. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, my first memories of him are, are not of... Well, I guess it wouldn't be 73, I'm not sure. It'd probably be the Winnipeg Folk Festival, maybe. 70. 1975. Was that? 75. Yeah. Yeah. Well, certainly any trace of uh, that was all gone. And, 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 and my, at least the my own ear taking me back to then was the big, rich baritone yeah. that just flowed and rolled. Mm -hmm. So you're responsible for that. Well, I'm not responsible <laughs> for his voice, but I'm certainly responsible for teaching him uh, correct vocal production. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't mind saying so. I'm going to play one more song called or for the day They're called Orders for a New Day. What is this? This is another one that uh, he and Bill Howell did together uh, with the military. This for this is for a uh, Remembrance Day special, yeah, I think, eh? that CBC did. Can't remember what year, 75, 76? We'll be able to tell by the quality of his voice. There you go. <laughs> Ariel Rogers, thanks again. Here is Stan Rogers, Orders for a New Day. Nation has sent the arrow Taking the tide at dawn Gaunt ships in a line with their burden of time Secret orders in the log And well-ordered men taking their shape in the fog in the seas before them A disciplined shore behind For two hundred years the forces were here On the shoulders of the town From the line of the hill strength of the people was found Right old man, battle ribbons in hand, and your eyes still on the flag. Would you send your son to an army that fights no more wars? Yes, I would, he cries, with offhand pride, in what he was before. Traditional strengths of men together where now we have peace working to better us all. Nation retains the arrow. 